Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia and today we are continuing our Trippy Let's Talk Lore series. Last episode, we left off with Cao Cao once again thirsting for a new talent after hearing Cao Ren talk up Liu Bei's new strategist Xu Shu. Seeing Cao Cao's lust, strategist Chen Yu presented a devious plan to kidnap Xu Shu's elderly mother as Xu Shu is a well-known filial son. Hearing this crafty and borderline unethical plan, Cao Cao is elated as he is a pragmatist, and even though he admires Guan Yu for his honor, Cao Cao has no honor himself. So a group of soldiers were dispatched to Xu Shu's hometown of Yinchuan, and within a day, they returned with Xu Shu's mom. Once in Xuchang, Cao Cao housed the old woman comfortably and asked her to write a letter to her son. But Xu Shu's mom was no fool as she refused and scolded Cao Cao. Enraged, Cao Cao ordered for her execution. But Chen Yu once again whispered in Cao Cao's ears that if they kill Xu Shu's mother, then Xu Shu will only become more firmly entrenched with Liu Bei. Instead, Chen Yu took the old woman in, claiming that he was a close friend with Xu Shu, and took care of her so that he could eventually secure a bit of her handwriting. Once he had her handwriting as a reference, Chen Yu copied the old woman's handwriting style and wrote a letter to Xu Shu himself. The letter states that she has been imprisoned and can only be saved if Xu Shu surrenders to Cao Cao. Chen Yu then had the letter sent off to Xu Shu in Xinye. Long story short, Xu Shu receives the letter and runs off to cry with Liu Bei. Now good guy Liu Bei here needs to stay on brand. So obviously, after shedding some tears himself too, he allows Xu Shu to leave. This was definitely not an easy decision, since as the chief strategist, Xu Shu knew Liu Bei's forces inside out. So if he joins Cao Cao, then not only does Liu Bei lose his most valuable strategist, Cao Cao also gains important intel on Liu Bei's forces. But regardless, Liu Bei lets him leave to save his mother. And before Xu Shu leaves, he recommends his friend Zhuge Liang as a new and better strategist to replace him for Liu Bei. Now, we know Zhuge Liang as this almost mythical character, but at the time, Zhuge Liang was just a young man in his 20s who was a well-known scholar, but his day job was a farmer, and he was content being just a smart farmer, as he was not out there actively looking for jobs like Xu Shu did. Now this was also not the first time Liu Bei heard of Zhuge Liang, as other scholars have previously recommended him as well. There was a very catchy saying at the time in Chinese called Wo Long Feng Chu, Liang Ren De Yi Ke An Tian Xia. Here, the sleeping dragon is a reference to Zhuge Liang, and the fledgling phoenix is a story for another day. So, as Xu Shu is leaving, he provides Liu Bei with Zhuge Liang's address and reminds Liu Bei that he must visit Zhuge Liang in person in order to persuade this eccentric mind to join their service. Then Xu Shu rode off, but he didn't head straight for Cao Cao, as he made a pit stop at Zhuge Liang's home to give his friend a heads up that Liu Bei will be coming. Hearing this news, Zhuge Liang was not happy at all, as he sighed and asked Xu Shu, why have you put me on the sacrificial altar? Without waiting for a response, Zhuge Liang retreated into the house, and Xu Shu returned onto the road as he raced towards Xu Chang to save his mother. Once at Xu Chang, Xu Shu quickly reported to Cao Cao and asked for his mother's release. Cao Cao laughed and informed him that his mother is not actually in prison and is living comfortably under the care of Chen Yu. But when Xu Shu finally reunites with his mother, it was not a happy ending. Xu Shu's mother went to town on him and brought up his turbulent youth as a youxia and a convict. She scolded him for his stupidity to come to join the usurper Cao Cao after finally making a name for himself as a strategist for the Honorable Liu Bei. The tirade went on and on as Xu Shu could only bow down and plead for her forgiveness. But Xu Shu's mother could not stand the shame that her son has brought on their family's name, nor can she forgive herself for the role that she played in her son's life. So that night, Xu Shu's mother took her own life by hanging herself. Xu Shu would serve out the rest of his life in Cao Cao's court as a silent strategist, 
as he has vowed to never provide Cao Cao with any strategies or advice. Meanwhile, back in Xinye, winter has set in, so with no risk of war on the horizon, Liu Bei, alongside his two brothers, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, rode out to seek Zhuge Liang. Their first visit ended in failure, as when they arrived at Zhuge Liang's home, they were greeted by a servant boy who told them that Zhuge Liang was out visiting friends from afar. So they rode back and had scouts sent to spy on Zhuge Liang's home for news of his return. A few days later, the scout reports back that Zhuge Liang has come back from his visits. So Liu Bei once again set out to ride with his two brothers for another visit. The second visit came at an inopportune time as a snowstorm sets in. And Zhang Fei, who never took a liking to strategies or strategists, nagged all the way there. Once they arrived, they were greeted by a young man, but he was not Zhuge Liang, but his younger brother Zhuge Jun. Zhuge Jin informed them that his brother Zhuge Liang has left a day ago on a hike with some friends. Already bothered by the journey in the snowstorm, Zhang Fei immediately turned around to leave, but Liu Bei scolded him for his rudeness as he cordially chatted with Zhuge Jun to find out a bit more about the Zhuge clan. The Zhuge clan has three boys. Their father died when they were all relatively young, so they were raised by their uncle. And eventually, after his death, they moved to the Jin province, as it was a rather peaceful place in this time of war. The oldest brother, Zhuge Jin, currently works as a strategist for Sun Quan in Wu. The second brother, Zhuge Liang, and the youngest brother himself, Zhuge Jun, lives here as hermits to stay sheltered from the chaos of the time and just tend the land and farm. After this short chat, Liu Bei asks if he could write and leave a letter for Zhuge Liang when he returns. Zhuge Jin agrees and brings out the writing utensils, and Liu Bei leaves a letter stating that he has come twice and is seeking the talent of Zhuge Liang. After he finishes the letter, Zhuge Jin bids Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei safe travels, and the three brothers once again braves the snowstorm to return back to Xinye, empty-handed. But just as they left, they ran into an older gentleman on the road, who turned out to be Zhuge Liang's father-in-law, Huang Chengyan. Now, Huang Chengyan might not be an important character in the Three Kingdoms history, but he was a very connected character. His wife is Lady Cai. If this name sounds familiar, it is because there is another Lady Cai, who was the second wife to Liu Biao. These two Lady Cai's are in fact related, as they are sisters. This would make Huang Chengyan, brother-in-law to Liu Biao and Cai Mao, who is the brother of these two Lady Cai. This would also make his daughter, Huang Yueying, Liu Biao and Cai Mao's niece. So, despite historical documents stating that Huang Yueying, or Zhuge Liang's wife, as being an ugly woman with dark skin and yellow hair, I think Zhuge Liang did quite well for himself in this marriage arrangement. And the fact that someone like Huang Chengyan, who you could argue was as well connected as you can be in the Jin province, would agree to such a marriage should be a testament to Zhuge Liang's abilities. Because if you objectively look at it, Zhuge Liang is a nobody in the Jin province. He's not a local boy, and his brothers are basically orphans who are refugees in the war that have come to the Jin province to read their books in peace and tend the land as simple farmers. But his smarts brought him a lot of fame, as fellow scholars nicknamed him the Sleeping Dragon, and he didn't even actively seek out this marriage. Huang Chengyan actually approached Zhuge Liang and offered his daughter, who was probably having a little trouble to be married off because of her looks. Dark skin, yellow hair, really wasn't your traditional Chinese standard beauty, which highlighted fair skin and dark hair. But Zhuge Liang gladly took the marriage, and essentially became in-laws with the lord of the Jin province, Liu Biao. Okay, that's enough about Huang Chengyan. Let's go back to Liu Bei and his third visit to Zhuge Liang. This time, spring has arrived, and the three brothers once again set off for Zhuge Liang's home. But after the failures of the first two trips, not only was Zhang Fei nagging this time, but Guan Yu was also starting to doubt the validity of their visits. Liu Bei, however, remained convinced that Zhuge Liang was a worthy talent, and the three of them made the trip. When they arrived, the servant boy finally brought them some good news. 
Zhuge Liang is finally home, but he is currently napping. Liu Bei tells the servant boy to not wake him and offers to wait until he wakes up naturally. Since Liu Bei is here to persuade Zhuge Liang to abandon his farming life to come work for him as a strategist, Liu Bei was simply trying to be polite here. The servant boy shows Liu Bei into the house as Guan Yu and Zhang Fei waits outside with the horses. Two hours later, unsure of what's going on inside the house and a bit tired of waiting, Zhang Fei asked Guan Yu if they should go in to check on Liu Bei. So the two of them showed themselves in, and what they see is that Zhuge Liang is still snoozing in bed while Liu Bei remains standing out of respect. Seeing this, the temperamental Zhang Fei finally had enough as he dashed for the kitchen, not to eat, but to grab the flint so he can set the house ablaze to see if Zhuge Liang can sleep through that. To find out if Zhang Fei will burn down Zhuge Liang's house, come back tomorrow as we finally get to see Zhuge Liang in action.